What a wonderful celebration. It's wonderful to gather together and always remember what the Lord has done. What, for 109, 110 years, God used the sewing circle here at East Petersburg to impact community, impact individual lives, and impact the world. And we know in Ecclesiastes it says there's a season for everything. And so we're in a season now where this ministry is, is, is transitioning out of East Petersburg. But as seasons change, it's important to honor and remember what God has done in the seasons we were in as we look to where God may be leading us in the future. And so today we're grateful that many of you who were part of the Sewing Circle could come back and join us and, and celebrate what God has done for 110 years here at East Petersburg. Laverne, great job of sharing. Dottie, thank you for leading us in that song. I want to give a big shout out to every single one of you and say thank you for being part of Sewing Circle, whether you were the ladies there actually there or their husbands supporting them on their, in that ministry. You provided much needed quilts, materials, but most importantly, you provided people with hope, hope in humanity. Imagine being a parent. Put yourself in the parent's shoes of an African village that's impoverished. And every single night, you watch your two small children go to sleep, shivering because they're cold at night and they have no clothes but the clothes on their back to cover up with. And then one day, some missionaries come and they have quilts that you took your time to sew. And they give their, that quilt to the family, this mom, and she brings it back to their kids. And for the first time ever, she gets to watch her kids fall asleep warm and snuggled underneath the quilt that you made. You brought hope to that family. So again, thank you. To everyone, we say welcome. My name is Chad. I'm part of the Faith family here at East Petersburg, and we're so glad you're all here. Thank you for joining us online, and if you're visiting, thanks for making time to be in your schedule to be here. We aren't here just to celebrate Sewing Circle, even though that would be enough. We're also here for a time in the Word of God and to worship. As a church, we've been in the book of Acts for the last 26 weeks. We're currently in Acts chapter 19, and last week Caleb tackled the first seven verses of the Acts chapter 19. Today we're going to look at the rest of the chapter, and then begin in the chapter 20. It's quite a large section. We won't have time for everything. We wanted to honor or give time for the sewing circle, um, so we will, we will in the, towards the end, summarize some of the passage. But the idea in this passage, today we're going to look at, is revival. Revival pops up multiple times throughout this year in America. If you remember, the, if you watch the news, the University of Asbury was having what they would call a spiritual revival. They were having worship, continual worship and people were being strengthened. Um, a movie came out this year called Jesus Revolution that celebrated the revival that happened in California and was called the Jesus Movement. This year we've seen a few revivals. The revivals have actually been happening for hundreds of years. And that word, when we hear it, we actually know what it means, though. Revival can be defined in two ways. First, it means a strengthening of something. When there's revival in your life, there's a strengthening of, of your morals, a strengthening of your relationship with Jesus. If something's not working, maybe you want to revive it and strengthen it to keep it running. Another aspect of revival is to bring back to life something. After a forest fire, organizations will go into the forest region and revive it. They will help plant new trees. They will clear out the burnt houses and cars so that the things that um, have died can be revived or brought back to life. So as we talk about revival, when we hear that, we think about the strengthening of something or bringing back to life. In our passage today, we're going to see how revival comes to an entire city and transforms people's life. Why is re revival important for us? Why is it important for our individual lives? Why is it important in churches? You see, as Christians, we're called to strengthen one another, to bring, to stand with one another, as you ladies were doing for years in Sewing Circle. We want to stand with one another. The Bible says we are actually dead in sin, and so when somebody turns from their sin and gives their life to Jesus, there's revival in their life. That's part of what our calling is, to, to give hope, revival to hope in people who are hopeless. You see, sin and the devil, they kill and destroy people in churches. 
Jesus is in the business of reviving them, reviving broken sinners into destiny living saints. Jesus revives churches that are falling apart and withering. He brings them back to life and strengthens them by the power of his spirit. As Christians, we are called to be revival makers. We are called to be part of revival in churches and also in our personal lives. What does that look like, though? I don't know if we can, our imagination can capture what truly happens when revival sweeps individual lives or church, but today in our passage, we're going to get a glimpse of what revival looked like in the city of Ephesus. And we're talking about revival because we've experienced a little bit of revival here at East Petersburg. God's bringing new life and God's bringing some freedoms into East Petersburg. God's in a season of transition for us. And we're feeling the, the joys of that and the, and, the, and the love of that. And so it's important for us to continue to look at that. I'm excited to talk about revival. We need it. We need to be strengthened. We need our life to be continually renewed in the Lord. Revival is happening here. It's happening in our community. It's happening in individual lives. But I believe that God has more for us than we have yet seen. I do not believe God is done bringing revival to you as an individual as you pursue Jesus or bringing revival here to East Petersburg. He wants to bring revival in greater measures than we've ever experienced before. And so as we dive into the passage and look at these four aspects of revival real quick, let us, let us have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of the Sewing Circle. We thank you for the service that every single one of these people here, whether in the Sewing Circle or serving in different areas of ministry, Lord, we thank you for the work you're doing in our lives and in our minds and in our hearts, and we ask that you would continue. Do not abandon us, Lord, but continue to walk with us as we pursue you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. So jumping back into Acts chapter 19, there's Bibles in the pews in front of you, or if you have your own or on your phone, please feel free to go ahead and open that up. Um, if you remember last week, Paul arrived in the city of Ephesus. It's a major city in the Roman Empire. Um, we're going to see that today in our passage, how there's, it's a giant city containing um, lots of people, but it also contains one of the seven wonders of the world. It contains the Temple of Artemis, which was the lar- one of the largest pagan temples in the, in the known world at that time. And so we're going to pick up, we're actually going to start this chapter Uh, this passage in in verse 20, and then we're going to work our way backwards, because 20 is a key verse here in the midst of this entire passage. So Acts chapter 19, verse 20, reads, So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. The word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. That's how the Bible describes revival. (laughs) When it says the word of God here in this verse, it's not talking about our written word, okay, because they didn't have the Bible then. It's talking about the word that Paul was preaching, the way he was casting out demons and healing the sick, the gospel. That is the word of God that was going out mightily and prevailing. Revival was happening. And how do we get to this reality in verse 20 of revival happening? We're going to see verses 8 through 19 are going to give us four aspects of revival that we can walk into. These four aspects of revival, in order to remember them better, because I know I don't have a very good memory sometimes, put together an acrostic poem to help us. The word for the poem is love, L-O-V-E. And this is so important because revival is about a radical love for God. That's where it starts. In our own lives, if we want to be strengthened with Jesus, the love we have for him must continue to grow. It doesn't matter how old we get or how young we are, if we've been a Christian for two months or 20 years, we can continue to fall more in love with our friend and our Savior, uh, even in the changes of life. And so that's part of revival. Revival then pours out as it's growing in our life, pours out to others around us. And so the L for this acrostic poem, we're going to see that in verses 8, 9, and 10 here. Verses 8, 9, and 10. And he, Paul, entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greek. So in verse 8, it tells us that Paul entered a synagogue, 
when he got to the city of Ephesus. Remember last week he first met these 12 disciples and they got born again. And then after discipling those disciples, he moves into the synagogue to speak boldly about the kingdom of God. And he does that continually for three months. Then verse 9 says, after those three months, people became hardened and disobedient. And they spoke evil of the way. They said, we've had enough of this, Paul. Stop it. When in that, it happens in verse 9, says, okay, fine. He took the disciples, he took those who had become Christians, and he went to the school of Tyrannus. Verse 10 says he was at that school teaching the disciples for two years. And so from that place of discipleship, Paul could reach so many more people than he could himself. Just like you ladies, when you are sowing and working for the Lord, you reached more people around the world than you ever could maybe yourself by what you were sending out from this church and from that group. One ancient, though not inspired writing, says that Paul held his meetings at the school of Tyrannus from 11 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. You see, that was the time when most people rested from their work, and so the regular students and teachers would have not been in that school. They would have been taking their siesta. These hours would have been the off hours of the school, and thus Paul used the space to teach about the Lord. So part of what allows the word of God to grow mightily and prevail, as we saw in verse 20, part of what revival is in, the, in Ephesus was a deep learning of the Lord. There was this deep hunger for learning about Jesus. It says in verse 9 that he taught in the school daily. So every day from 11 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon, Paul was teaching the disciples. Hundreds and hundreds, actually thousands of hours, Paul poured out into the disciples' lives in Ephesus. And they learn more about the Lord. We see this, actually, the fruit of this in the book of Ephesians in our Bible, that epistle. A lot of epistles are um, character things or problems in the church, not the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians dives deep into theology, deep into some of the things of, of the Lord, because he had two years to train them, so he doesn't need to write to them about the basic things anymore. He can get deeper and deeper and deeper with them. That was part of revival, that continually learning about the Lord. You see, the more that we learn about the Lord in our lives, the stronger our faith will be. If you want revival in your relationship with Jesus, if you want to strengthen your relationship with him, if you're feeling like, my relationship with Jesus is kind of stale, I'm kind of in a rut, I, I don't know what to do, start just learning about him. Listen to podcasts, watch sermons, get down on your knees and say, Lord, show me who you are. Dive into the living word of God, because this word says the Holy Spirit is our teacher. We don't actually need anyone to teach us. The Holy Spirit will teach us all we need to know. One element of bringing revival in our life and strengthening that relationship with Jesus is to learn more about him. So make time for him. Learn about your friend Jesus. He is the best person we could ever be friends with. In our church family here, we're dedicated to the living word of God. This book contains the eternal truths of our eternal God. Now, this isn't the only way God speaks to us. He speaks to us through other people. He speaks to us through circumstances, dreams, visions, prayer, and worship. But the Bible is an amazing place to start, and we must always continue in the Word of God as God speaks to us through other means of His communication. This is part of the reason why here at East Petersburg Mennonite Church, we're a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching, Bible-loving faith community. It's a great foundation that we can love each other and love our community. Our Lord, who is the living Word of God, is in this book. He's living inside of us. He is the Spirit who strengthens us. But we are warned in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge because they didn't know who truly God is and how to serve him and how to follow him. They're actually destroyed. And so we need to learn more about our Lord. And there's no place better to start than in the word. Folks, God is moving among our church. It's a beautiful thing to experience. It's a beautiful thing to be part of and celebrate. He's moving in our lives and will continue to live by the truth written in this word. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us from the life around us, it's the spirit and the truth. Revival will continue to grow. So that's the first aspect of revival, learning about the Lord. Learning about the Lord, the first part of our L for our acrostic poem. We're going to look at the O for our acrostic poem, and the O is found in verses 11, 12, and 13. No, nope, excuse me, 11 and 12. 11 and 12 says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that the handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and their diseases left them, and evil spirits went out. 
Revival was happening in Ephesus, and part of revival is extraordinary miracles. Paul was operating in the miraculous. The way he was living the faith, he was exercising the prayers he were praying were miraculous. They were powerful and life-changing. Paul operated in the miraculous, and that is the O for our acrostic poem, operating in the miraculous. Look at verse 7, or excuse me, verse 11. It says he was performing extraordinary miracles. So I guess there's normal miracles, <laughs> and then there's extraordinary miracles. I'm not greedy. I'll take any type of miracle, Lord, whatever you want to do, all right? But apparently here there was extraordinary miracles. Now, in all seriousness, it's important to note that God was performing the miracles. God was performing extraordinary miracles, it says. How was God doing that, though? Did God himself come down and heal them? <laughs> for a time, for 33 years he did, or for three years during Jesus' ministry, but then Jesus physically, God physically left. Okay, so God didn't come down and heal them. Did God open the heaven and send the angels to perform these extraordinary miracles? No. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Through a mortal man, this immortal God who we worship and love performed extraordinary miracles that defy the logic of science, defy the natural order of sickness and death. Miracles are not natural. They are supernatural. And God did the supernatural miracles through Paul. And I hope to encourage you and say that I believe God can do that through every single one of you here today. As we grow into revival, as our faith is strengthened, as our belief in God's power is given fresh life, I believe that every single one of us can operate in the miraculous. I believe someday people could look at our life and say God performed extraordinary miracles by our hands. God performed extraordinary miracle by the hands of Jonathan, by Les, by Lucille, by Jeremy, and they would glorify God. Yes, healing is important and extraordinary miracles are beautiful, but there's, a, there's also miracles that move in our lives that are not so extraordinary. Sometimes we can't see a healed heart. Sometimes we can't see a changed life right away. That's miraculous as well. Each and every one of you is a child of God, given power by the Holy Spirit, and when you give your life to him, he plants a seed of faith inside of you, in your heart, and revival grows that into life. Your relationship is strengthened, and you can start to operate more and more in the miraculous. Yes, the miraculous healings, but also the miraculous thing of loving neighbors that aren't very easy to love. <laughs> loving family members who may have hurt you or betrayed you. That's miraculous as well, because forgiveness, forgiveness and restoration, that's miraculous. As a church family, as God continues to bring revival here in East Petersburg Mennonite Church, don't be surprised if miraculous things happen. There might be a Sunday morning when someone comes in on crutches with a broken leg and we pray for them and they get healed instantly. There may be a Wednesday morning prayer gathering where someone is sick and we lay hands on them and pray for them and God does an extraordinary miracle through the hands of that prayer gathering. Family, if more miracles start happening in this church or in your lives, in your workplaces, in your families, don't be weirded out. Don't be scared. Okay, God is on the move. He'll move. He's like the wind, the Bible says. He'll move as he wants to, but he loves to move through us. If revival happens and miracle happens, let's just be ready for whatever the Lord wants to do through us. We've been blessed, actually, over the last year with multiple miracles. People's shoulders being healed, people's health being better, people making it through surgery and cancer. We must just continue to pursue him, and from him, revival will flow. Revival is about love, love for the Father and love for others. The L in love, learning about the Lord. The O, operating the miraculous. And then verses 13 through 17 are going to give us the V of our poem, this third aspect, revival, which will be victory, victory in spiritual warfare. Let's read verses 13 through 17. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I command you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirits answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt up on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, 
and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. All righty then, that's pretty intense. In this verse, we have some Jewish exorcists. Verse 14 says they were the seven sons of Sceva. These seven sons were part of a Jewish group called exorcists. They would go from place to place, and they would cast out demons and trying to set people free. In the Jewish culture, they had their own books, they had their own methods, they had their traditions on how to cast out demons and set people free with incense and different tools. But in this passage, we see the gospel impacting even non-believers. We see the seven sons of Sceva forgetting their Jewish tools and calling on the name of Jesus. You see, when revival is happening, there aren't even, in, in our lives or in our churches, people who aren't Christ followers notice and there's power in Jesus' name, and that God is real because of what Christians are doing. And so in the case of these Jewish exorcists, they noticed that Paul was preaching Jesus, and he was casting out demons in Jesus' name, and he was doing this by the power of Jesus, and so they started copying him. And so what does it say? They, it, the, the exorcist would go in and say, I command you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to leave. That's, we can say the same thing today, folks, but the question is, how did the demons in this story respond? The demon-possessed man says, I recognize Jesus. I know Paul. But then this demon-possessed man looks at the seven sons of Sceva and says, who are you? You see, these Jewish men came in the name of Jesus because they knew about Jesus, but they did not know Jesus. Jesus was not part of their life. They were simply using the name of Jesus the name above every name, the name that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And these Jewish exorcists were using that name, the name that will rule the universe to cast out demons. But this particular demon was not having it. This possessed man was having, did not obey them because they didn't have the living word, they didn't have Jesus living inside, and they didn't truly have the power of God inside. They were simply invoking the name. And so verse 16 says, one demon possessed man. One man subdued all of them. He actually stripped them, and they ran out naked. Sewing circle. This man, these men could have used some of your quilts to cover up as they ran out of that house, right? But it really does make me wonder how many naked and hurting people around the world actually did wrap themselves in your quilts. How many people stayed warm and clothed themselves with the things that you made and sent overseas? How many? Guess what? The glorious thing of the reality of eternity, when you stand before your Father, He will tell you. He will lay out and say, look at all the nights that you kept somebody warm because of what you did in Sewing Circle. That's what we look for. That's the hope we will have is one day we will know the impact that we made on this world while we lived here. Anyways, it may seem strange to you. How can one possessed man beat up seven sons, strip them and clothe them and make them run out? Because spiritual warfare is no joke. Spiritual warfare is real and demons do possess people and demons are strong and demons do act up. I remember there was a time when the Lord sent me to Senegal, Africa and part of that orphanage is they would rescue orphans from villages way out in the African area, more the desert area. And they'd bring them back, and most of the time these orphans had demons inside of them because there was witch doctors, and the witch doctors were, they would take care of the kids and curse them, and then just a lot of dark things. And so when these orphans would come into the orphanage, one of the first things they would do, they actually had a special room where they would put the new orphan into, and it was a wonderful room, but it was a room just to keep them separate from the people until they could pray over them, right? Well, one day we had, they received the new orphan, and they were starting to pray over this orphan. And they were, it was a 12 or 13 year old girl, and she was starting to manifest a demon pretty intensely. And so they actually called us and says, Hey, we need some help over here. This, this girl's getting out of control. And so me and my missionary buddy that I was with, Nate, ran over to this other building where the, where the female orphanage was. And there was the female missionary who normally does some of the, the prayers of cleansing and, exor and exercising these demons or casting these demons out in the name of Jesus. She was sitting on this 12-year-old girl's chest trying to hold her down. There was a pastor from America holding one arm. There was a pastor from, uh, I forget where he was, holding the other arm. And then me and Nate hopped and were holding her legs down, trying to cast out this demon that had possessed her. And this 12 or 13-year-old girl was lifting five adults off the ground. We couldn't hold her legs down. We couldn't hold her feet down. That's how strong this demon inside of her was. And praise the Lord, though, that God is stronger. And that lady was set free. 
we took a break that day, and they, they put her back in the room, let her calm down, and they had a different team come in and, and minister to her and love on her and cast out the demon, um, which is important. But what's important to know is that victory in spiritual warfare comes through Jesus Christ. That is why the V in our acrostic poem is victory in spiritual warfare. When revival is coming in your life, when you're being strengthened more and more as you walk with Jesus, you will see more victories in the spiritual warfare. The evil spirit of anxiety that constantly attacks you and makes you worry as you learn more about the Lord, as you start to walk with him more and more, as your relationship continues to grow, that anxiety will, that spirit of anxiety can be cast off in the name of Jesus. You can pray with power and have victory in spiritual warfare. When the demon of depression or lust or anger or greed come at you, and they, and they will, when they do, as you're walking with Jesus, part of revival in your life is you'll stand strong in the face of the devil's strategy. And you will say, be gone, evil spirits, because there is victory in Jesus Christ. And the devil can't stand in the face of the victory that Jesus has made available to us. We are not like the Jewish exorcist. We know Jesus. We, we have a relationship with him. In fact, the Bible says we have been clothed with Christ, and he knows us. Do you understand what that means, though? That if we're in this relationship with Jesus, if we're walking with Jesus, that also means the demons know us. They didn't know those seven sons of Sceva, but they did know Paul. See, Paul was in a relationship and walked with Jesus. As you walk with Jesus, demons will know you. The question is, what do demons think of you? Do they see you as someone who prays in power? Do the demons see you as someone who threatens the kingdom of darkness by the way you love others? by the way you serve one another, by the way you are light in this dark world? Do demons fear you because you are known by the almighty God? Or do the demons know that they can defeat you like the demon-possessed man defeated the seven sons of Sceva? When you get up in the morning, do the demons say, oh, this is going to be easy to ruin their day? Or when we wake out of bed, we wake, or when we wake up and get out of bed, do the demons quake and shudder in fear because you are a child of God who prays and loves one another and has that relationship with him. We can continue, all of us, to grow more and more. We're doing a wonderful job. Each one of us is on a journey. We're all with Jesus. We're all walking with him. But this life is not about one moment with Jesus. It's a continual thing where we continually grow into him. Our victory in spiritual warfare only comes through Jesus by his blood shed on the cross and the throne that he established for all eternity. It is in Jesus that we stand strong and can shake strongholds of darkness. Because of Jesus, we can lay hands on people who are possessed by demons and we can say, be free in the name of Jesus. As God continues to bring revival here at East Pete, let's not be scared or surprised if in one of our services a demon manifests itself. When that happens, church family, let's not be weirded out. Let's smile and say, hey, there's freedom and victory in Jesus Christ. If God wants to do that here, let us be ready. We can't control anything. We don't want to manifest anything by the way we minister or sing or preach or anything like that. But we want to be ready if God chooses to have this church and us faith family as a place where people come and get healed and want to be set free from their evil spirits. Victory in spiritual warfare is part of revival. And to the fourth aspect of revival, we'll see in verses 18 and 19, we'll see the E of our acrostic poem is extreme repentance. Verses 18 and 19. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practice magic book brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone and they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver (laughs) so in verse 18 we want to note that it was many who believed these people had come to repentance they renounced their evil practices already and so they weren't non-believers they were christians who god was calling into deeper repentance they're people who've already on this journey with jesus but part of our journey with jesus is a sanctifying journey sanctification means to be made more holy to become a process of becoming holier so that's what the believers were in the process revival brings us into a place of repentance of holiness through extreme repentance in this case you see as revival is happening in the, in ephesus the christians hear what happened to the seven sons of Sceva, and they come to recognize wow the spiritual kingdom is real 
and they want nothing to do with darkness. They only want the light. And so in verse 19, these believers, these Christians who practice magic, brought their books and they burned them in the sight of everyone. That's extreme repentance because they could have taken those books and sold them for hundreds and thousands of dollars. Biblical scholars say that 50,000 pieces of silver in our day would equal to about 1 million to 5 million, depending on inflation or where we're at. 1 million to 5 million dollars. So they could have taken their books, sold them for money, and then given them to the church. Why didn't they do that? That seems great. Oh, but they didn't want anyone else to get a hold of those books of darkness. And so they forsake the money, they forsake what they could have gained from it, and they simply came and burned it before everybody. He will illuminate areas in our life as we're walking with him. Areas that we don't even realize we have sin, areas that we don't even realize we're in darkness. And then at that point, when God is working in your life, you have two options. Two options. You can humble yourself. You can confess your sins and repent, and the Lord will continue to bring his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy there because he is so loving and caring for you. He wants you to walk in holiness. He wants to forgive you as you approach him with repentance and humility. Or or as God, as you grow with Jesus, your sin is revealed, you could push God away. You could push God away and you could choose your sin over God. And that family will extinguish that flame of revival in your life. Do not ignore the convictions of the Father as the Holy Spirit reveals sin to you. Repent and be more holy. Jesus even says in the Gospels, he says, unless we repent, we too shall perish. Repentance is an important start of our journey with Jesus. As God continues to bring revival here at East Pete, there might be a Sunday when someone's convicted by the Lord and they stand up and confess and repent in front of everybody. There might be a Sunday when someone comes forward and says, I want to receive Jesus, I want to repent of my sins right now. If that happens, let us be ready. Let us not be scared or weirded out. Let us not be judgmental. Let us be gracious and excited for these re- times of repentance. In 1859, there was revival in Ireland, sweeping across Ireland, and they had a huge um, shipping industry. And so the revival was coming to these shipyards, these men in the shipyard. What happened is they were having some extreme repentance, and they started bringing all the tools that they had stolen over the years of working there. The tool, the piles of tools these Christian men were bringing were so high, they didn't know what to do with them. So the shipyard manager says, hey, we understand you want to repent of your sins, but you can keep all the tools you stole. We don't know what to do with them. They didn't know what to do with them, but that was what repentance was calling these, and revival was happening in Ireland in 1859. That's what these sailor, these shipyard workers were being called to do. Extreme repentance is part of revival, and that brings us back to where we started. Verse 20, the word of the Lord was growing mightily. We need the word of the Lord to grow mightily and prevail in our lives and in this church. When our hearts are in a place where we pray more, and we want sports and games, revival will be stirred up. Our heart is in a place with the Lord. Family, with God's help, we can be a church that continues to walk in whatever direction God wants us to walk in. God is moving here. God is moving in Ephesus, and let us rejoice in that. Now, we don't have time for the rest of the passage, so I'm simply going to summarize it, but it would have been wonderful to continue to look at this together with you. We want to summarize of 19 and a little bit of 20. So right after this word of the God is happening, in verse 21 through 40, the Christian persecution starts and a riot happens, right? People come and they want to stop the revival. They want to stop what's God doing. Don't be a person who stops revival, okay? Let it flow. Let God move in it. That happened here. So in 21 through 40, there's a riot. They talk about the temple of Artemis. Um, It's greed and idolatry that stops revival. Because of this persecution in Ephesus, 20 through 20, 20, chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, talks about how Paul leaves. He says, okay, I got to go. They're going to kill me if I stay. I have to leave. So he travels around the surrounding Mediterranean area, and then eventually he arrives in Troas. If you remember, Troas was where Paul grew up. He spent, or, yeah, he spent some time there in Troas as well after he became a Christian. Verses 27 through, verses 7 through 12, Paul preaches in the Christians in Troas. And uh, it's, if you read, read that passage, it's quite interesting. They have church service. They end up at church service. Paul teaches them for hours. He teaches them so long. They're in this third-story room. that they, There was a guy sitting in the window. The guy fell asleep. <laughs> he fell asleep. Paul was talking so long, and he uh, crashed and died. Paul runs out there, 
pray, like jumps on the guy, prays for him, and says the guy was brought back to life, right? Um, I'm glad I don't teach, <laughs> we don't teach that long here, that people are falling, and then you don't have windows to fall out of, so if you do fall asleep, I'm glad you're resting in the presence of God. That's great to do, okay? Um, they did it in the Bible, so maybe it's okay. But uh, it's amazing what I find, what happens is Paul, the guy revives back to life, Paul goes back in, they have communion, they have their fellowship meal, and then it says Paul continued to teach until daybreak. So five or six more hours. A guy falls asleep, Paul. Maybe you should get the message that you should be done teaching. And Paul's like, no, I'm going to keep teaching for five or six more hours because he had, a, he had a desire for people to learn about Jesus and know him. And so that sums up our passage. And to sum up the lesson of the week here, I hope we probably guessed that revival is about love. As we love the Lord, guys, as we pursue him with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our souls, and all of our strength, that love we have for God that you have, that I'm excited to see in you every week when I have, we have meals with you, when we come to church with you, it's great to see the love you have for the Lord. But if your relationship with your wife or your spouse or your friend is, oh, it's okay, yeah, it's good, my relationship's good, wouldn't you want your marriage, wouldn't you want those friendships to be great? The thing with Jesus is we can never truly get to, like, excellent. It's always pursuing him. We're always growing more. What was excellent as you pursue him, becomes a new excellence. We just keep going with God. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And that, that love for the Lord spills out into other people. So as we lo learn to learn about the Lord, as we operate in the miraculous, we have victory in spiritual warfare and extreme repentance. Those are the four aspects of revival in your life and in the church. And if, so if you struggle with Jesus, just focus on one of those and say, Lord, I want to I wanna operate in the miraculous. I'm going to try to, I've never prayed for somebody. I'm going to pray for them. And see what the Lord does through you. You know what I mean? See, do you have some sin that God's been talking to you about? Maybe you've hurt someone in your family. Maybe you've been hurt by somebody. Call up and say, I don't agree with what you did, but I forgive you and I love you. And that repentance will open up deeper avenues of, of relationship with Jesus. I'll invite the worship team up now. As we enter this last worship song, because of the sewing circle, we're running a little behind schedule. That means the connect groups, um, young adult or youth, so Lighthouse and elementary and their teachers, you guys can be dismissed now before we'll start this last song. We just want to honor that connect group time where they're growing in the Lord in that area. And I just want to remind all of us that we do not live for the miraculous movements of God. Okay, we're not living seeking after all this healings and tongues and these things like that, but they are a great benefit for our journey. We get to see God through those, right? We get to see God and experience those things, but we also don't want to be on the side where we push those away. We don't want to be the side that quenches the Holy Spirit either, and so we want to find that balance of pursuing Jesus, and as he brings the movement of the Spirit, we want to be a church that's open to whatever God wants to do. The end goal is love. For if we have the craziest miracles or big demons are being cast out and there's extreme repentance but we don't have love, it's nothing. It's nothing. So let the love we have for the Lord stir us up to greater things as we grow together, learning to live and love like Jesus.